All right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Believers Together. We are truly those who are covered and washed by the blood of Jesus Christ as elect. We are believers together in the name of Jesus Christ, who is Lord. Amen. And we're just grateful that uh, we are here gathered in his name, wherever two or three gathered. We know that the Holy Jesus is in our midst. And we're just grateful that the Father who sent His Son Jesus to bring and show, reveal the love of God to us as is present with us through the Holy Spirit. So we are just grateful that we have that willingness to come together by the power of the Lord, be continuing here on, especially this is Palm Sunday, where we, we remember how Jesus rode on the donkey, He came into the, to the Jerusalem, the temple, riding on a colt, and, uh, or a or a donkey and, and was proclaiming as they knew he was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so we welcome everyone and wish you all a very happy, blessed Palm Sunday from my Marianne and I and to you all. And also remember that uh, we are gathered because it is because of the Lord's sacrifice on the cross that what he did. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Easter is coming up, the risen Lord Day, that'll be next Sunday. And also I just want to let you know that uh, uh, you know, uh, this is Good Friday, this is Holy Week, so we are grateful that uh, we have to remember. And, you know, every day really is is Risen Lord Day. I, I really believe that. Every day is the day we Amen. celebrate Christ, the Risen Lord. So it's not just um, the day we specify typically where it's Happy Risen Lord Day. I mean, I, I know it's called Easter, but I don't even like called Easter because the roots of Easter is not biblically correct. But, you know, it is... Happy blessed Easter, okay? But I, I, I prefer to say, you know, nice. risen Lord Day. He's risen. Happy Hallelujah. Jesus is a risen Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. So anyway, we have Believes Together. You can get information about the church at believestogether.org. And my name is Pastor Bob Tarasiak. And my precious wife, Melania, is with us, Mariana. And also Faith is here physically. She comes and watches and listens to the sermon, too, so... She's my number one listener here. Well, my number two besides Mariana. We love you. I miss you. Oh, don't forget, us a couple of announcements too as well. Uh, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, we have the Bible study going through the book of Galatians. Really exciting, great information in there. And also on Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 1 p.m. Eastern on Thursdays, we're going through the whole entire book of Isaiah. Really exciting. We've already gone through part three. And we're going to part four this coming Thursday. And also, again, tithes and offerings, you can do that to support the ministry here. Through our website, you'll find information at believerstogether.org. All information for that in our address and Zelle or whatever you want to do, you know, PayPal. But anyway, we love you all. We thank you. And also, if you have any prayer requests, please send your prayer requests to me at rtarasiak at gmail.com. Or to my text, uh, or text, you can send it to 859-240-2503. Where you can text a, a prayer request that's a really important thing. Or if you want to just talk, or if you need any type of pastoral care, uh, call me or send me an email. And I'm glad to be able to be there for you all as believers together. All right, so we're going to open up with prayer to say thank you, Lord God, for this blessed day we have on Palm Sunday. So let's just pray and we'll start. Oh, forgive me, excuse me, before we pray, uh, today is the Lord's Supper. It's the first Sunday of the month, so we want to try to do the Lord's Supper. So if you do, please uh, take an opportunity to get your piece of bread or, or leaven bread or tortilla or whatever you might have, grape juice or wine, whatever, it doesn't matter. And uh, we're going to do that at following the church worship service. So again, Lord's Supper today. So let's just pray and begin. Father God, we thank you uh, for the blessings you give us, Lord. And we thank you for the privilege of being the King of kings and Lord of lords over our lives. But we are bond servants. We were bought at a price, at a price that was paid by your son, Jesus, Father God. So, Father God, we are blessed to be here today and privileged to be part of your God's, your elect, that we are here because of believing, believing and, and, and repenting and believing that, Father God, you have given us a life and life more abundantly. And so, Lord, we're grateful that we can come together to worship you in spirit and in truth. And, Lord, we pray for those who are dealing with issues in their lives whether it's uh, physical things or spiritual things. Father, we lift them up to you for healing, for power, and I'm dealing with this toothache, Lord. Pray that uh, you know I can hold on to this and deal with the pain till Monday. And I pray, Lord God, that the, the dentist will get me in quickly tomorrow to try to resolve this, uh, along with Mariana's appointment tomorrow. 
we love you, Father. We thank you that this is just temporary. When we get to heaven, this will all be go away. No more pain, no tears, no more sorrow. And we thank you for the privilege of being children of yours that were grafted in by grace. We love you, Lord, and we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen and amen. amen. Oh, Lord, yeah. Father, we thank you, Lord, amen. for this wonderful music we've given you, Lord, and we just thank you, God, that you have given in our hearts and a new heart and touched us with your Holy Spirit presence that we can be truly overcomers in these last days. And Father, we're grateful that we can truly turn to you for the yeah. salvation of our souls, to know that we have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. Yeah. And to understand about eternal security. And Father, help me and help those listening this morning as we come to our message to understand about predestination and the elect. Who are the elect of God? Who God for purpose this, foreknew this, all this, and knew before the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. who would choose him and who would, he would choose actually love us and so Father let this message be a message that it is from your word and let a message go through me as an oracle of God Father Amen. and Father let people Jesus. understand and hear this truth about the eternal security we have in Christ that you have God has chosen us to be part of your kingdom Amen. we love you Lord and we pray this all in Christ's name Amen and Amen, Amen. Well, when we finished the Acts of the Apostles part 71 parts last week and that was quite a long series but this won't be too long this is first peter we're going to be in first peter this is the first peter series in the new testament part one and the, the words uh the, let's say the message text is in first peter chapter one verses one and two only two verses but in the bible it could be one verse even two three words that you when you expound upon it when you go dig deeper to the meat of the word you can you can write a book uh, you know, so, 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 you know, there's no rush. We want to discover the word as the word discovers us. And that's important. So we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And the title of the message is Predestined, Justified, and Sanctified Elect of God. We are the Predestined, Justified, and Sanctified of God. And the subtitle for the message, All Because of Christ's Love for His Sheep. So let's read now. And again, we're going to have the Lord's Supper at the end of this. But 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and this is God's holy word in the standard version. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with His blood, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Interesting here, we can see that God is, uh, P Apostle Peter is addressing, opening up his letter, his epistle, and he's writing this letter in his opening statement. He, he just really expounds upon the importance of who he is, who he's writing to, to these four churches in the present-day Turkey area, of, in that area of there, who are dispersed. And he's talking about this, for knowledge of God and, and sanctification. And you know, um, for me, it was 39 years of my life, I was 39 years old, where God already preordained and that I was going to be his elect. And of course, I responded to that because he drew me to him in John 6, 44, and he opened my eyes to the truth of the gospel, the good news of Yeshua. And so because of that, my life was changed. I became born from above. Born again to a new life, to a new creation. The old and past. Look, all oh, behold, things have become anew in my life. Hallelujah. And so because of that, it's exciting mm -hmm. to know that as a believer, as you are a believer, you are part of God's elect. Fourth known by God. Predestined that our destiny will be eternal security in life. And so the first point is this. The elect of God are chosen by God by His will. The elect of God are chosen by God, by His will. See, Apostle Peter starts his letter to these five churches that are in dispersed with an important aspect of what? Of God's sovereignty regarding His elect who were what? The saints, agios in the Greek, set apart, called out, you know, called out from this world to be God's elect children of God. And so those who are members of God's kingdom, not of the will of mankind, not of our will, not of any works we do, but the will of God and the choice of God whom He drew from those he chooses to come be part of his kingdom. It's exciting. So the use of this word election here in this text emphasizes that membership of the God's people is due to God's initiative, 
God's mercy, God's grace, God's love, prior to our human response, made before time began. Did you get that? He has, he's, God is not limited by time, space, or matter. Not by time, not by space, not by matter. He knows what tomorrow, but he knows what's going to happen three years from now. And the Bible reveals many things that happen, not only in the past, present, but also in the future that we know through Revelation, through Daniel, all the prophetic words that are unfolding even in front of our eyes today. So God foretold, God knows who were his, by his will. We pray that pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So it's God's will. He's the potter. We are the clay. We submit and he molds us and shapes us every day. And that's the power of the part of the gospel of God. Thy will be done. And so it is God who call men and women to his people and those who respond are the elect. Now, the important thing is the amazing concept is that God already has predestined his elect Again, even before the beginning of time. And I want you to understand this because Scripture re 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 you know, reinforces Scripture. Scripture reveals Scripture. Look at Ephesians. Now, this is Peter. Now, look what the Paul wrote to the Ephesus church in chapter 1, verses 4 through 5. This is important because, again, we have to see the importance of God choosing us. Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and 5. Even as he chose us and him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, Verse 5, Ephesians 1, verse 5. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons, of course, and, and, and daughters, through Jesus Christ according to what? To the purpose of his will. Write the scripture down. It's in your sermon notes. I, I didn't put the scriptures. I didn't know. But anyway, write it down. Check it out later. Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5. Important. Another place where even Jesus spoke about through Apostle John, who recorded this, the beloved one, the youngest of the apostles. John chapter 15, write this down again. John 15, verse 16. Then we're going to look at John 15, 19. But first, John 15 and 16. You did not choose me. Uh, wait a minute. You did not choose me, it says there. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. And let me read that again, John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. You know, again, the reveal this of that God chose you that you are his elect. is a life-changing experience. John 15, verse 19. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because, because you're chosen, you're the elect, you are not of the world. And here it is the key. But I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Jesus' words again. Not mine. Jesus' words. The word of God. The part of the elect chosen. Remember, God is sovereign. He, it's his world. It's creation. It's all things. He's the main man. He's the seed. He's the president. Just like there's a sovereign nation in the United States. There's a sovereign nation in Italy. No. God's sovereign over his theocracy. Theos meaning God. And his, his whole kingdom is over that. So again... He, his will is to do his in his provincial domain as he wants to do. God calls, God's call does not depend on any virtues or merits or work of human kindness or humankind or anything we do of ourselves, humanness. We cannot earn salvation. There is nothing infallible man that they can do to achieve justification apart from God. Period. God calls, God judged, God predicted, God foretold. And this is exactly what Peter's talking in this theological sense. He's writing to these five churches. The importance of this, these Jewish people who were converted, who were dispersed because of persecution. And Apostle Peter is reaffirming this to them in his letter. So, again, as I said earlier, Apostle Paul, as well as Apostle Peter, as we're looking at today, he reinforces, Apostle Paul reinforces Apostle Peter's writing and mentions the important premise of his letter of, of the elect. In uh, to the Corinthian church in Corinth regarding the importance of boasting in the Lord, but not ourselves of any human kindness. God does not call someone because they are wise in their own ways, in a worldly sense, but God even chooses the fullest thing to shame the world that wisdom. Look at 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. Write down, you can check it out later if you want to turn in now. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 26. For consider your what? For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring in nothing, things that are. So that no human, this is, this is the point, this is grace. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ, Jesus Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The ideal premise here is what I'm trying to say is, God has called us. God has the elected God, chosen by God, by his will. And so that's important. So Apostle Paul is saying this, Apostle P is declaring this, that those who were dispersed were Jewish believers who were converted to the way of Christ. We've seen that the way of Christ in Acts, that term the way. We are, we are the way of Christ as Christians. And of course, and they departed out of Jerusalem, dispersed people, to the five areas and, 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 and the five the dispersed churches, due to what? The persecution of those who were of Jesus. And that's just what he's saying here. You know, we have to humbly receive this truth. We can't boast on ourselves. We are total fallible. We are totally incapable of doing any good to, to uh, appease God into salvation. Nothing in our human sense. We are sinners. We're all fallen short of God's glory. There's nothing we can do to appease God to receive and justify ourselves. God has to draw. God has to give us faith. God has to bring the truth to us so we can repent, so we can call upon the name of the Lord and say, He does it all, though. It's by grace you're saved through faith. Not of any works, so I mentioned both. It is the gift of a call of the elect of God. So important. Let's understand this. So the effect of election is to leave no grounds or whatever for human boasting and achievement and position. Whoever the elect is, they owe entirely to God. Well, why, Pastor Bob? Because God gets the glory. Without God drawing, calling his elect, and opening the eyes, those who are not of God, whose non-believers remain in darkness, and they remain lost. Period. Here is more scripture support in this biblical premise. We go to Romans 8, 28-30. Again, talking about the elect of God, predestined of God, according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28-30. This is what the Word of God says by Apostle Paul. And we knew that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to His purpose, for those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, in order that He might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. Hallelujah. That's the stage of light, isn't it? God, for acknowledging us, we become the Christ. He predestined us from that call. And then he, he called to be justified because of his son. And then from the justified, we will come to that glorified state when we finally get home to be with the Lord. As believers, that Jesus paid the price of our sin. And God drew us to the truth. God drew us, predestined us, foreknew that we are part of God's elect. God does it all. You know, there in the, uh, in the book of the call, The History of Christian Doctrine on page 317, uh, someone wrote this, In the wounds of Jesus is predestination understood and found and nowhere else. Let me say that again. In the wounds of Jesus is predestination understood and found and nowhere else. It's only through Jesus Christ. God has predestined you and I to understand the depth, the width, the height, the length, and the, 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 the severity, the, the sovereignty, the, the truth of God's word through Jesus, what he did on that cross. It's foolishness to those who are perishing. But for us, it's the truth. Amen? And those who are God's elect receive this and understand the depth of the truth, of, of the, the importance of the cross, extreme importance of what Jesus did on that cross. The question I have for you is this. Has God predestined you for, for his call? Justification, sanctification, eventually glorification? Do you know for sure that if you die tonight that you'll be saved? It's only God's elect who have that security. And basically, when you respond to the draw of God, and he opens your eyes and spiritually to see, the word of God comes alive in you and you become born from above, and you now have eternal security. Knowing that Jesus did it for us, a gift, not we earn. Hallelujah. Well, that brings us to the next point. Point two. The elect of God are foreknown. The elect of God 
are foreknown. There are many who not do. There are many today, even Christians, who not grasp biblical truths regarding how God, how God, you know, does as He wants to do. And here, Apostle Peter is emphasizing that God knows the past, the present, and future, and He does as He will or not wills to do. And He does what He wills or what does not want to do. Same with our prayer time. When we pray, God will answer in His ways, His will, and how He wants it for us. He knows what's best for us. Sometimes we don't understand why I make us decisions, but we'll find them eventually, I believe, when we get to heaven. But for now, we have to trust and obey, for there's no other way. You know, lean not on our own understanding. But the elect of God are foreknown. And I want to share, Apostle Paul affirmed Apostle Peter, again, in his letter to the Roman church regarding God's sovereignty and will over his creation. Let's look at Romans 9. Romans 9, said, write this down, read it later. Romans 9, 17 through 24. Romans chapter 9, 17 through 24. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, For this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show you my power in you, and that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he, we're talking about God, has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, well, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? It's a question. Will what is molded? Say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter, God, no right over the clay, his people, to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessel of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Remember that glorified state for glory. Even us whom he called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles, a question mark. And the answer is yes. So we see Apostle Paul, and we see the understanding as Scripture reveals Scripture, Scripture reinforces Scripture about God's elect, about his predestined, about the foretelling that he knows who it is before the even beginning of time. And it's revealed here again. Who, and who do we say? God can choose who he wants to say. God can say who he wants. God doesn't have to say with him. It's he's the party. He's the he's the main God. We have no right to complain to God. No right to say anything against God. We should just say yes and amen, Lord. Thy will be done. Humble ourselves. The proud will blaspheme God's name. The proud will not want to listen to the word of truth that this is about. But the humble. Those who are, who are teachable spirit will listen to what the Word of God says, not my opinion, the Word of truth. Peter mentions two important items in his opening of his letter regarding the dispersed elect believers to clarify the position of God with the perspective of those chosen by Him. First of all, we see in verse 2, God foreknew who His elect are, and then secondly, the Holy Spirit is to bring sanctification of those elect. What? For obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with His blood, and then to be able by the Holy to be able by the Holy Spirit to walk in obedience after justification. Well, how? Well, this was all accomplished by what? By God's grace through His Son's sacrifice on Calvary on Mount Golgotha. Today is Palm Sunday. He's riding on the donkey coming into town. And glory to the King of Kings for those who are awakened. God's elect. They understand. They recognize. The king of kings coming down from the olives, coming down in Jerusalem to the temple. They recognize this is the promised Mashiach, the king, Yeshua, the Lord Jehovah, Jesus, in the flesh, incarnate, God incarnate, Jesus Christ. is walking in. When they raise their palms, glory to the king, hallelujah, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, right? God's grace, and it says in that verse 2, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. Very important. You see, when it comes to this fourth knowledge, God only knows the future. He alone can foretell with 100% accuracy. You know, in the past, there were many times where people, very famous people, made certain comments or, um, you know, were against a certain new methodology or whatever it in the world. But I want to share about uh, three of these things that people have said about certain things that were going to happen in this world sense. Who, who again, not knowing the future, because God only knows the future. Here's one. Marshall Ferdinand Falk in 1911 said this, Airplanes are interesting toys,
but they have no military value. Well, boy, oh boy, was he wrong about that, wasn't he? Uh, in Business Week in 1958, this was written in Business Week magazine, 1958, quote, with over 50 foreign cars already on sale here, the Japanese auto industry isn't likely to carve out a big slice of the U.S. market. Well, lo and behold, we know that sure changed a lot, didn't it? Toyota, Suzuki, you know, Kawasaki. Uh, and then, finally, in U.S. Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, on December 4th, 1941, just before the Pearl Harbor attack, Frank Knox said this, Whatever happens, the U.S. Navy is not going to be caught snapping or caught sleeping. Boy, oh boy, they sure do when they came to Hawaii. They went happy. So again, God only knows the future. And again, this, this kind of examples show how much we think we know, but we really don't know, do we? No one knows the future. We have a premise we can read the Bible and understand a little bit what's going to happen. Yes, we've got a general picture. A general God is not going to leave our faith. He's going to reveal this thing through the Holy Spirit and show us what's going to happen in the future. But God knows exactly the time and when because we don't know the day nor hour. But God does. And we just got to trust and keep an eye on the signs and watch out. Stay in the Word of God and understand that. And that's the truth. Well, what does the call, the elect of God, apply to the believer? What, is, what happens there? Well, point three. The elect of God have grace and peace applied to their lives. The elect of God, those predestined by God, have grace and peace applied to their lives. How many of us need more of God's grace and peace? Yeah, I raise my hand. I need more of God's grace and peace. I don't know about you. But, and again, he says that, may God's, may grace and peace, again, this is the beginning of Peter's letter to these five dispersed churches, May grace and peace be multiplied to you. First, Peter, because how much God loves his elect because of sending and sacrifice of his only son, Jesus the Christ, on the cross of Golgotha by what? Grace alone. May grace, again, be multiplied to you. The only all-sufficient sacrifice for the sin of mankind is the shedding of blood, a sacrificial life for the life of another. And we're going to celebrate that Lord's Supper, what he did on that cross, just in a few moments. Again, it's for God's elect. Grace is applied to those of His through and only through what? Through Jesus, who took our place on the cross by grace, a gift. Remember that. That's so important. This grace be multiplied. Grace. Grace in the Greek is charis, where we get the term charisma. It's, you know what it means to define biblically grace? I looked it up. According to the, uh, the, the, the Bible, it's this. A favorable attitude towards someone or something. In other words, favor, goodwill. Let me say that again. Grace is this. It's charis. It's a favorable attitude towards someone or something. The favor, this goodwill. Like we say, to all, goodwill toward man. This is grace. It's God's favor. He's done a great favor for us. We're all condemned to hell without Jesus. But God sent His only begotten Son that whoever believes Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And God knows who are going to be His believers before the beginning of time. He foretold this, He foreknew this, and He knows that who are His predestined elect. And throughout the Scripture, again, it refers to Scripture, reveals the Scripture, and reinforces that. And we can know that we know that we know we have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. Because God has sealed us by the Holy Spirit as a promise, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. We are sealed until the time we're redeemed. This is the power of the gospel. We don't have to doubt. Satan, the devil, demons want to put doubt into us. But God says you have a secure foundation. The rock of our salvation. Jesus is the rock we stand upon to know we have eternal life. Well, here are two examples. When you talk about this charis of the uses of God's grace. We've seen earlier, way, way back in the Acts of Apostles series, beginning probably around the third or fourth act part in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. This is again, this is Dr. Luke who wrote the Gospel of Luke, but also he wrote the Acts of the Apostles, Dr. Luke, writing his dissertation, this letter to Theophilus, this governor, this Roman governor. And he said in Acts chapter 2, verses 46 to 47, this, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor it's the same word 
with all the people, and the Lord added to their number by day by day those who were being saved. So there is again the use of God, praising God, and they were having favor with all the people. God was giving them that grace. And then finally, same thing who wrote Acts, Dr. Luke, in Luke chapter 1, 30, and he's talking to the Gentile. And the angel said to her, this is when, remember, when God, the angel comes to Mary and, you know, and says, hey, by the way, the Holy Spirit overshadowed you. You're going to bring Jesus into the world because Jesus already existed before the beginning of time. He was in the beginning. He was in creation. So Luke chapter 1, verse 30, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found what? Favor with God. Again, that's this Greek. That's this grace that we have, this charis. And so we see again, back to our original text, in this verse 2 of at 1 Peter chapter 1, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. We've seen the part of grace to be multiplied. Now let's look at the peace aspect. You know, the elect have peace applied to their lives. Peace here in the Greek is irene, where we get the word irene. So when you hear no no some irene, that name means in the Greek, peace. It means tranquility, to be without trouble, to have no worries, or to sit down in one's heart. You know, the heart gets racing and the heart can be uh, nervous and we, our, our heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up if we come into an anxious part or we, something tries you, something happens and we, someone scares you or, or something happens and, and, and you know, your, your heart just pumps harder and it, it's like it's, it's, it's racing. But then here is this Irania, this peace that only God saying and, and Peter saying, let it be multiplied. This peace that comes to you, this tranquility, to have no trouble, to have that sit down in one's heart. To rest, right? So Peter wished grace and peace, but also for the, both of them to what? To be multiplied. To be multiplied. What does that word multiply in the Greek? It means to be abundant, to grow. So may grace and peace be grown to you. Let it grow in you. And you're only going to grow in this how? To grow in the Word of God. To grow in His truth. To read the Bibles. To bring it and help us to develop within us, in our hearts, this this understanding and wisdom. So we understand what grace is the gift that we don't earn. And there's nothing we can do to achieve it. God has predestined his elect before knew who were his. And we just subject ourselves to that grace, the gift, and this peace. Let it be multiplied. Following, and I want to share another verse in Romans chapter 11, 2 through 5. And I want you to understand because in Romans 11, it talks about that Jewish people, the Jewish people who rejected, many they rejected, there will still be a remnant. There will always be a remnant when it comes to believers who will be in the last days. Look at Romans 11, 2 through 5. God has not rejected his people whom he what? Foreknew. Do you do not know, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How we appeal to God against Israel? And it, this is a quote from there, Elijah. Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars. And I alone am left. And they seek my life. Well, poor Elijah's like, I'm the only prophet left. You know, man, that's it. I'm lonely. I'm, what am I going to do? But what does God's reply to him? Verse 4, Romans 11. I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to bow the false god. So, two at the present time, again. Now, Paul comes back. He quotes uh, from Elijah. So Paul, I said at the present time, there is a remnant, what? Chosen by grace, by grace, by the gift, the elect. He didn't reject these people, and they will eventually come at the last days when the 12 tribe is 144,000. We know that. So, you know, someone said, I don't know the source, it's unknown, but the peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of the trouble, but is rather the confidence that he is there with you always. Let me say that again. Peace that Jesus gives is not the absence of trouble, but is rather the confidence that he is there with you always. When we are God's elect, when he foreknown us, the peace of Peter saying, hey, this is, even though you're dispersed, even though you were chased out because of the persecution, remember whose child you are, whose name you bear, and that God has given you a gift. And he knew this before the beginning of time that he would chose you, that you were predestined, that you would be God's elect to be part of his kingdom. And when Jesus comes back with his kingdom and God's going to send him back, he's going to come back and will rule as saints with the Lord God most high. What a wonderful, gracious promise that we can have grace and peace multiplied 
to our lives. Has grace and peace been multiplied in your life? Are you growing in God's grace, His peace, and that growth promise, the, the growth promise of sanctification? You can answer that question. I can. I don't know your heart, but God knows your heart. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. We need to grow in God's grace. We need to understand that. As you, if you, and let me get me wrong, you know, we do make the choice to believe. But God already knows who are His elect, who be destined, who have been drawn by God to you make that to believe in God, to repent. Because that's the Holy Spirit given to his elect that convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then we can repent, we call on them, we confess our sin, and we go forward. That's part of the growing in God's grace and that sanctification process. But are you saved? Have you understood these truths? Do you want to be part of God's elect? You can do that right now and say, Lord, call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And then you know you are of God's elect. Let's pray. Father God, you are an awesome God. We love you. We thank you that you have chosen us from the beginning of time. You knew us, even when we went before, before our mother's movement before that, that we were destined to go through this justification and the process of sanctification and finally to the glorification of our leaving our physical state to a new body, to new life, and to be present with the Lord, because we know, Father, your word says that to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Father, we know the thief on the cross, he didn't get baptized, he didn't, uh, you know, uh, didn't anything to arm works or anything, he just said, you know, I believe you, you don't deserve this, and he, he knew that he was, Jesus was the Son of God, your Son was, and, he, and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. It's not of works. That man on the cross on one side was God's elect, the other one was not. So, Father, help us to continue to grow, to understand your truth, your word. And, Father, we pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are dealing with all kinds of issues. And, Father, as we come now to the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, we ask you, Lord God, that you help us to examine our hearts, to make sure that we are walking in truth and walking in spirit. Yes. And Father, as Apostle Paul said in Corinthians, at the first within church about uh, to do this in remembrance of me, he told us to examine ourselves. Are we real believers? Are we God's elect? And so this morning, today, this afternoon, we need, before we take part of this bread, Symbolically, we're talking about Jesus' body and the juice. Symbolically, talking about or wine about what the blood of Christ. We are to just take a moment now to reflect and to make sure that you know, as believers, we are partakers. If we're not believers, then we don't partake of this. It means nothing. Then. But if we as believers, we are God's elect. So let's now pray. Take a moment to just have a moment of silence and just talk to the Lord and ask for forgiveness of anything we might have caused. Uh, break up, but break, you know, that cause problems that we know that God's convicted us. So let's the Holy Spirit talk to us now. Father, we know that on the night you were betrayed, you took bread and you broke the bread and you gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which was broken, given for you, to do this in memory of me. Let's remember and partake, as this bread represents the body of Christ. Amen. supper was ended he took the cup and again he gave thanks and praise he gave the cups to his apostles and disciples and to us even today in its essence he said that this blood is the blood this wine this juice represents the blood of a new covenant and for without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and so Lord this blood
body, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, Jesus said. So now let's not partake of this blood that Jesus gave for us and shed on the cross, and symbolically in his juice. Let's not partake in Christ's name. Father, we thank you, Lord, what you did on the cross for us. We thank you that we, as believers, those of us, we are your elect, that we can come to you because of what you, your son, did who opened the door, because Christ is the door, in essence, kind of in a metaphorical way, that we can come to you, Father, only through the Son, for Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for what he did on the cross. And we thank you that he is the risen Lord, that he's in heaven, and that he's our one mediator between God and man. And we thank you, Lord God, because you are mighty to save. The grace of, the grace of God, we're so favored by you, God, that we can be in your presence, that we can know we have eternal life and eternally secure because of what your son did, not what we do, not that we can do. We're totally depraved. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that we as sinners can trust in what your work of your son did on the cross. We love you, Lord. We honor your precious name. And Father, we speak blessings upon everyone watching this video. As they bless, as they come, and blessed as they go to and fro. And Father, keep us on the highway of holiness as we wait for your return of your son to take and receive his sheepfold for everlasting life in the kingdom of God. We love you, Father. God bless this day. God bless this holy week to remember that this week is a week that we should dedicate our time to remember all week and every day what Jesus did for us and how much he loves us and that we are so grateful and to honor and worship him and knowing that we are part of his flock. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We thank you for being part of Believers Together. My name is Pastor Bob Tarasiak, and I just love you all. Mariana and I love you all. Our dog Faith loves you too. And... <laughs> And so just have a blessed holy week and enjoy uh, this time remembering what Jesus did for us. He is the risen Lord. We love you. We thank you for your participation. Again, uh, we are Believers Together. You can support this ministry. You can go online and find that out at believerstogether.org for more information. And watch previous sermons and videos and go way back. So we love you. God bless. And uh, leave a like and uh, let your comments be known, and if you have any prayer requests or anything you need to talk about, or call me, 859-240-2503, or you can send an email to rtarasiak at gmail.com. Love you. God bless you all. Again, remember, this Tuesday, we have Bible study at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. We're going to be continuing the book of Galatians, and this Thursday, we'll be in Isaiah at 1 p.m. Eastern Time, and continuing the book of Isaiah. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you.